You are listening to CEO Perspectives, a podcast by the Conference Board. Welcome to this episode of CEO Perspectives, a signature series by the Conference Board. CEO Perspectives are conversations that take an objective, nonpartisan look at a range of timely topics that matter most to business leaders. To help make sense of these topics and how they'll unfold, we'll sit down with thought leaders and do what we do best at the Conference Board, provide trusted insights for what's ahead. I'm Steve Odlin from the Conference Board and the host of this series. And in today's conversation, we will discuss how to tell your human capital story. It's becoming increasingly essential for leaders to measure and communicate their organization's human capital strategies, sustainable practices, the impact that they're making, the progress towards employee well-being, and so forth. We'll also talk about why now? Why is this so important now? And what are the benefits of sharing this information? Joining me today is Dr. Rebecca Ray, the head of our Human Capital Center at the Conference Board. Rebecca, welcome. Well, thank you, Steve. It's a pleasure to be with you as always. So, Rebecca, you have a brand new report in the Human Capital Center that's entitled Telling the Human Capital Management Story Beyond Mandated Disclosures, to strategic competitive advantage. Tell us a little bit about this new report. Sure. Well, first of all, thanks again for for having me join you. Um, This is the culmination of a CHRO working group uh, that we've been working on uh, in partnership with the ESG Center with Paul Washington as its leader. And uh, we spent uh, the better part of a year uh, pulling people uh, together to discuss uh, what we believe is a a rise in the need for transparency among many different constituencies, as well as what we anticipate will be even more prescriptive uh, requirements that come from the SEC, particularly important for those uh, companies that are publicly traded in the United States. And so uh, we pulled together experts from uh, the legal sphere, from communications, we partnered with Sacred Shaw and with Edelman. We also brought together C-suite leaders, We also asked sitting uh, directors to join us from their perspective. And so we tried to look at this particular issue from a variety of perspectives. And so the report that we just released this week is the culmination of their insights, as well as our sort of considered thoughts on where we are now and where we're likely to head. So specific to your question as to to why now, I I do think there's a convergence of things. I think we are living in an age of, of increased transparency. I think people want to have a better insight into how companies are run and whether or not investing in a particular company is a riskier bet or not, depending on how much information they can glean. I do think that candidates who are thinking about working for a particular company want to understand how well it's done. I know investors want to know uh, about how well a company is run, particularly as it relates to, uh, let's say, slave labor or human trafficking. Certainly, they want to know how fairly employees are paid. And I think regulators want to know that if there's anything that's material to the business from a human capital perspective, that that is that that is disclosed. And that, I think, is a trend that will only continue over time. Yeah. Now, you mentioned uh, the regulatory environment and specifically the SEC. There has been a new set of rules around that. Describe what those rules require from companies. Sure. Well, at the moment, it's it's not that terribly extensive. It does require, for example, number of employees and CEO pay, but it does require in a very broad way uh, for companies to disclose what might be material to the business. And they would have to decide what is material to disclose, the level of disclosure. And, you know, I know we've, we've talked about this in the past that with disclosure comes risk, but there's always business risk when there's disclosure. Um, and so I think that has to be very carefully weighed. There are benefits, but there are certainly risks. It used to be sort of a single stakeholder world where everybody's focused on the shareholder. We now live in a multi-stakeholder world, customers, employees, owners, community, suppliers, as you mentioned. And so part of the requirements here, the regulatory requirements, but also the demands are coming from this new multi-stakeholder world. Describe how that has impacted the current state. I do think that in every case, the people or the entities with whom an organization interacts are looking to be able to trust that organization. Can they trust them that the leadership um, has a good sense of where the business needs to go given a competitive landscape or no end to the number of changes that are um, roiling uh, companies and markets? 
But I think investors want to be able to trust that the reports that are given, the the financial updates, the assessments of strategies, that they can trust that the company is in good hands and is well positioned to compete and win. But so are customers. They will vote um, with their dollars as to whether or not they believe a company treats its employees fairly or that they have a, a lighter footprint, for example, in the sustainability area or lower carbon footprint. They, they also want to know how DEI plays itself out in that organization, whether or not women and people of color, for example, or underrepresented groups, whether or not they are given access to opportunities. And customers, I think, have demanded that and they're going to continue to see it. I think there's no putting this back in, in the box. I think this is only going to continue. And uh, employees are making choices. We know from our research and that of others, they will make choices as to whether or not to join a company or certainly to leave a company uh, if they don't feel aligned with the kinds of values that the company espouses. I think what's really key here is that there has to be a concerted effort to build a human capital management strategy, not just led by the CHRO, but with all of the C-suite members. And the board has to play a role in the oversight here. And all of that has to match up with all of the different ways in which people tell some version of that story to one or another of the sets of constituents. Yeah, now you you know you mentioned the United States and and the SEC, which is the regulatory body for public companies in the United States. But th- this is starting to spill out beyond the United States. Talk about the international trends in this regard. You know, I think in many ways Europe might have been a little earlier to the party uh, for us, and there are a lot of frameworks, and that's one of the things right now where we're in sort of this transitional mode. There are a variety of frameworks, for example. A World Economic Forum has one uh, that it partnered with the Big Four to write. Um, ISO has one, and it's m- much more along the lines of uh, industrial standards. And so those have been uh, around for a while. SASB, for example, which just recently emerged into uh, an entity called IFRS. You know, Steve, the predecessor to this report was a, uh, a report called Brave New World. And we looked at seven of the most common frameworks around the world. And they have many things in common. We looked at what was most commonly asked. We also asked whether or looked at whether or not these were qualitative measures or quantitative measures or a blend of both. And um, there were there were quite a few where there was there was at least a, a coalescence around these different uh, areas that people asked about. So occupational health and safety, diversity, training, and employee engagement were among the top uh, most common elements that were requested in these different frameworks. But I think there's also interesting to note that it continues on with things like employee recruitment and turnover, human rights, certainly, and whether or not that's from the Sustainable Development Goals for the United Nations or ISO or the World Economic Forum framework, I think they're all trying to get at the same thing, which is to paint a complete picture to the extent possible about how the human capital element of any corporation drives business results and also how they make choices around how human beings in the workplace are treated. And it's amazing to me how much coalescence there really was, although these are very different frameworks and people can, at the moment, choose to follow one or another or some blend of several in their internal preparations. I think it's when the the disclosure requirements come down, that's when you'll see that of this subset, here's what really needs to be disclosed. So, you know, describe that you're using the term framework and, you know, some of our listeners may not be familiar with what you're describing, but what is a framework and, you know, what's required versus voluntary? Sure. Well, many of these frameworks are not regulatory in nature, um, but they but they do suggest that you should look, at least internally, even if it's not disclosed, that you should look at these various areas. I do think that over time, these frameworks, which are you know, again, flexible in many in many cases, you could choose as an organization to use parts of one or another. Some people, some organizations are further along in the sustainability reporting area. And so they might lean toward what was the SASB, uh, which is now part of a uh, combined entity. But there is a lot of overlap in all of these. And so companies need to be thoughtful about what they're going to what they're going to hang their hat on and also how consistently they can report, whether that's climate change information or, you know, broader sustainability goals, 
and now some of the human capital management where there's a lot of overlap, particularly in the DEI space. Yeah, so they're just outlines or templates that right. these organizations have come up with that, that kind of outline, and you can and companies can just plug in their their information and data so that it makes it easy to um, to compare across organizations because then they're in a standardized format. So um, you know it, that's, but there are so many of them, as you say. Do you think that uh, this will these frameworks or these templates will come together and become one at some point? I don't know that the frameworks will will necessarily all blend together, but I do think once the more prescriptive regulatory requirements come out, you will then see a, a sharper definition here. Yeah, because the lawyers then will have to make sure that the companies are, you know, being compliant, uh, you know, so it's it, it's not just then at that point strategy sharing, it's also, you know, it's a compliant. Uh, That's right. That's right. And, yeah. and, and even in, in examples for the ISO, for example, they, they have a framework that is fairly prescriptive. There are dozens of things that they suggest you look at, but there are only really around 10 that are usually disclosed publicly. So I think there's a there's a rationale for understanding what your human capital management strategy is internally, having your board have oversight, having it be part of a, a larger discussion or integrally tied to hopefully the business strategy. And that doesn't necessarily mean that all of that's going to be disclosed. I can't imagine that it would be. You know, in, in the past, um, when companies have talked about disclosing some of these data, the pushback has always been that they are competitive advantages, you know, or, or they're disclosing, potentially disclosing competitive advantage, you know, trade secrets and, and you know, things that would, if if disclosed, give away inside information to the competitors. What has changed, uh, you know, regarding that argument? Well, I think a couple of things. Um, certainly, you would want to be cautious about what's disclosed. If you were to, for example, talk about a, a significant investment in upskilling all of your people in a particular skill set, for example, let's say that they, they were going to undertake a digital transformation and they talked about the skills that they needed for employees to now have in order to complete that transformation. That might signal a change in either the uh, the service or the offerings of an organization, or it might signal that they were looking to acquire a company that had that skill set already well in hand. You know, I, I think certainly there's a there's a reasonable expectation that you would want to be cautious about what's disclosed. Yeah. So so you know, use these templates, but do think about competitive strategy in this is what you're saying because you don't want to you don't want to give away something that. Uh, that damages your your competitive stature going forward. Certainly, certainly uh, not. That that that's exactly right. So so I do think that there's an opportunity to think about this as a risk management exercise as well. And certainly it would be. You know what's disclosed, what's the the, the trade off. I think the the benefit for doing this is it perhaps can underscore a journey that a company is on, and it can talk about how it wanted to, for example, gain um, pay equity or have more uh, representation from underrepresented groups in their leadership ranks. And that's usually not a, you know, that's not a, let's talk about how we accomplish that next year. That's not how that's going to go, but it is going to be a multi-year journey. And it is an opportunity for a company to talk about the things that they've done, the progress that they've made and the things that they now plan. And that can send signals to prospective employees also to uh, investors, and also to uh, customers or suppliers uh, who may become a, a strategic partner. So I think helping to underscore how well run, how firm and strong the employee capability is in order to execute the strategy can send very strong messages of being solid, of being sustainable, if you will. We're talking with Dr. Rebecca Ray about the conference board's new report, Telling the Human Capital Management Story. We're going to take a short break and we'll be right back. As you and your company monitor the latest wave of shocks that have battered the U.S. economy, the award-winning forecast team at the conference board now predicts a recession by the end of 2022. This recession will further compound the crises that have recently upended original expectations from a deadly pandemic to a war in Ukraine and the highest inflation in decades. Yet, unprecedented crises also present unforeseen opportunities, 
if you have a trusted, proven navigator by your side. With that in mind, and as the conference board has always done, we are providing you with daily, timely, and relevant content that will guide the business community through the economic storm. These trusted insights are being gathered on our website and are available to help your company master the challenges ahead. Visit us at conference-board.org slash topics slash recession. Then on November 29th, join us for a live virtual briefing from our economists and other financial experts. It's complimentary to you and your colleagues. Register now on our website to hear the latest on weathering this economic turbulence. Welcome back to CEO Perspectives. I'm your host, Steve Odlin from the Conference Board, and I'm joined by Dr. Rebecca Ray, who heads the Human Capital Center at the Conference Board. Okay, so Rebecca, this is, uh, you know, we talked about the regulatory piece of this and, you know, what, what companies should say, but let's go back to basics. What is a human capital strategy? I mean, when you're talking about it, you know, what's the scope of what that looks like? Sure. So I think every company is going to need to decide exactly what it looks like. But generally speaking, uh, this is probably a standalone document that is intricately tied to, uh, let's say, an annual report. And it may or may not dovetail. It may or may not overlap. But the human capital strategy all by itself generally starts with several key components. There's a discussion of the linkage to the overall business strategy and what skills are necessary, for example, or what capabilities the organization will need to have. And then it generally talks about how this supports the business strategy. It will talk about structure and governance. It will talk about sort of a current versus future state. And in that, it would look at the skills, reskilling, upskilling, perhaps, career pathing, uh, the way performance is judged uh, by uh, employees. It will talk about leadership competencies and capabilities. It will probably talk about the strength of the bench, its succession management uh, processes. It will also likely talk about a, a talent acquisition strategy, particularly if there's a skill set that they're looking to develop or where they might look for tapping underserved populations as part of their leadership ranks. They'll talk about the compensation, certainly. And, you know, that was always a piece of disclosure um, that I think the board is particularly focused on, but that is now one, one large piece of, of many things. Talk about the rewards and compensation strategy. Um, DEI will be front and center, I think, for a very long time, particularly because most companies struggle with women in leadership ranks, for example. So they may want to talk about their goals there, their progress toward those goals. And then anything else that might be important or material to the business. They're certainly going to talk about any special initiatives they might have, might be progress on something that they undertook a year or so ago. They're going to talk about uh, risks and what they're doing to mitigate those risks. And then, and then really it's about here's our plan to get to where we need to go. Here are the milestones. Here's the progress we're making. Here's the way in which we believe we'll be successful. Yeah. Now you, you said something that's really important in there and it, you know, it, it bears, it bears a little bit more discussion. You, you can't just write one of these things and say, okay, here's the human capital thing. Now let's go back and, and do business. And, and, and therefore, you can't just have this, you know, a, a couple of people go off and write this on their own. It This is part of, this is the business strategy. It is part of the business strategy, right? Because this is, um, it, it human capital are the resources that drive the business. And increasingly in a knowledge-based economy, human capital more than, you know, invested capital in machinery and plant and equipment are the differentiators. So, so I think you know, th- that's an important point that you made. And it then, it therefore requires this to be a strategic document rather than, oh, that's the HR deal over there. Yeah, that's a sure recipe for a disaster, I think. Anytime you have an HR human capital management strategy that's disassociated from driving the business results, then all you're doing is you're sharing the, the warm glow you get from driving you know, 2 million employees through 18 hours of training a, a year and feeling very good about that. And while that may be an important step to take, what difference does it make? Whatever you're doing in HR should be so that you are driving some aspect of the business strategy. You are looking to execute something. We are doing this in human capital so that the business can accomplish X or Y. And, and that's really what this needs to be. 
And, you know, the, the underlying pieces are who gets trained, what gets trained, how you're accounting for performance, how you compensate people, how you retain and track. Th- those are all important elements of this. And you should know where you need to take the company, but it should be with a means to an end. It is so that. Yeah. And, you know, in an industrial based economy where, you know, you're making widgets, it was important to talk about, okay, we're, we're expanding a new plant in Omaha in order to make this. And here's the investment behind it. But when you're in a knowledge based economy and when your business is driven by people, the, the enablers of your strategy, your business strategy are the people. And so the, therefore the connection, you know, your strat, your growth strategy is all around this. And, and that's why this is so important. So, uh, that's why I think it's important that that our listeners understand that this is way beyond just a compliance document that somebody fills, you know, some lawyer fills out somewhere in a dark room. This this should be front and center on your business strategy. You know, not that you you know would would um, write your business strategy necessarily around any framework or template, but that the, but that that template or framework should therefore describe the business strategy. It's getting the order and the, and the priority right, isn't it? I think that's exactly right. And, and the point that you make about a couple of people going off, talented as they may be, sitting in a darkened room in front of a candle and chanting, and then coming up with a human capital management strategy is not the winning formula. You know, I think the point so many of us took after we listened to uh, sitting C-suite leaders and board directors and, and experts, you know, is this has got to be an integrated enterprise-wide approach. And everyone who's telling part of the story, the business story, which is going to have a human capital element. Everyone who's telling that story to whichever constituency um, they happen to be in front of, they have to take that same key source of truth, that same narrative, perhaps emphasize one thing over another because one stakeholder group uh, might be more interested in that than another. But we have to all be consistent. We have to tell the story about where we're headed and how our people are going to be getting us there. And that's the same story for everyone, regardless of where you sit in the C-suite. And that has to be a board directive. Yeah. And, you know, you made a comment in there about the the multiple stakeholders. Uh, You know, again, back to customers, employees, owners, communities, suppliers, you know, all these stakeholders that companies have today and they try to balance from a prioritization standpoint. There also needs to be narrative in the report that is relevant to each of these stakeholders because, you know, not one piece of it is you know, is is necessarily relevant across. Talk about how you sh- how people should approach this this story, the human capital story, as it relates to the stakeholders. Sure. Well, I think you have to be very clear about the the needs or the desires for understanding and building trust among each of those stakeholder groups, and then you'd have to figure out after you've generally talked about the human capital management strategy. What aspects of that would you want to emphasize? So, for example, if you were uh, speaking with regulators, you would probably be looking more at the and trying to disclose and tell the story about progress you've made about uh, a strong culture and a strong, uh, well-balanced uh, area where employees can thrive in the organization. If you were looking at strategic partners, you'd probably want to emphasize um, the great working conditions for your employees, their skill sets, how they're going to be a great partner. If you were looking at the communities that you serve, you would probably be talking about how your employees, as part of their connection to mission and purpose, were giving back to the to the communities. We're looking to tap local leaders to bring them in to give people more access to opportunities. You know, so I think it's and and, and I'll say this too, for employees, they're also listening to see what the human capital management story is, right? And so the thing that you want to make sure that you do is that the human capital strategy, that uh, management story that you're telling externally rings true for internal employees. They have many platforms and opportunities to share their lived experience. And you want to make sure that you know all of this aligns because what you want to do is you want those employees to be able to tell that same human capital management story the same positive trajectory that the uh, leaders of the organization are speaking about so that everyone talks about the same source of truth. You don't tell that story in a vacuum. You, you also then have to, you know, okay. So the first time you do it, it's, it's new, it's novel, it's unique, but as you continue to talk about the story, it's important to connect it to the outcomes that the business is seeking the goals, you know, how are you doing versus objectives? And that includes financial performance, doesn't it? 
It sure does. And in fact, many of the, the better human capital management documents that are filed, sometimes it's in a 10K, sometimes it's in the proxy statement, but sometimes it's its own standalone report. And among some of the better ones, they will, uh, they will directly link um, skilled employees and the number of patents, for example, or the ability to go into a, a new market or the ability to um, get to market faster because of enhanced skills. Well, they will talk about you know, being a great place to work and being recognized for that, which then becomes a beacon for attracting more talent to then enhance the, you know, the overall intellectual capital of the company. So I think it's it's really important to get that right. Yeah. And and then to track it consistently uh, over time, because you have to demonstrate that this strategy is working. It's not just a, you know, a static document out there. It has to be a dynamic document, a, a dynamic strategy, essentially, and and uh, and links to how the organization is succeeding with this strategy. Not only that, I, and I think it's very important to track progress, but I think it's also important to articulate the stability of the organization and its commitment to, let's say, diversity, equity, and inclusion, or to enhancing the leadership team, or whatever other metric you're working on, is to talk about the progress that you've made, and then here are the business results that we're seeing even as we move through this process. Yeah. And I think, you know, uh, that linkage to business results is so important to owners, you know, whether it's shareholders or or other owners, because it, it demonstrates that this is the right strategy, it's working, and uh, that you're on the right track. Well, at the end of the day, if a business doesn't do well and perform well, it can't take care of its employees in the way that it would like to. It can't provide competitive pay, for example, or may not be able to offer the access to opportunities or benefits or training. And it's important for a company to do well so it can reinvest in its community that it serves, in its people, and in research and development. And, and so everyone has a vested interest in making sure that an organization has the capability to execute, but also to ensure the sustainability of the organization. Because at the end of the day, if the organization doesn't thrive, it can't in turn provide a place for employees to thrive. Exactly right. Uh, Rebecca, before we wrap up, the Human Capital Center has a, a new and unique webcast coming up you may want to tell our audience about. Well, yeah, thanks, Steve. You know, I think for a lot of us, we've been looking at what the developments in disclosure and human capital management, and we know that it's going to continue to evolve over time. But we've got a, a unique opportunity on November 17th at one o'clock in the afternoon Eastern time to talk about human capability and company performance. And we're going to be joined, I have the great privilege of moderating this, but we'll be joined by Dave Ulrich, who is, uh, as most folks know, the uh, father of modern HR, and Ram Sharan, who is one of the world's greatest management consultants, and Bratan Saha, who is the vice president of machine learning and AI services at Amazon Web Services. They're going to talk about an initiative that they've just finished. They took the, they, they took the SEC filings from 7,000 companies. Uh, in terms of their regulatory disclosures, and they have gleaned insights from that. And they're going to talk about human capability, why it matters in today's changing business world. They're going to talk about a framework, again, another another framework for, for looking at this the particular lens. They're going to talk about the work that was done uh, in machine learning and AI and what the algorithms were designed to do in terms of gleaning insights. And then they're going to talk about why this matters to organizations and why companies should care. I, I can't I can't tell you how excited I am, and I hope everyone will join. It's complimentary. It's on our website. And again, it's November 17th at 1 o'clock, and I, I hope you'll join. So so people should go to tcb.org, and they can click on the Human Capital Center and sign up for the website. Yes, for the they can. Podcast. Yes, That's they great. Can. And it's free. Well, yes, I like to use the word complimentary, um, but okay, yes, it is free. Free works. All right. That sounds great. We're excited about it. Well, Rebecca, thanks so much for joining us today and talking about your new report, Telling the Human Capital Management Story, which also is on the, our website, tcb.org. Indeed it is. And thank you for the opportunity to talk to you about it and to, to, to share. And I hope people will pick it up and, and find it useful. So thank you, Steve. And thanks to all of you for listening in to CEO Perspectives. Every week, I'll be joined by a prominent thought leader to provide insights on the issues of our time. We'll cover leading topics in human capital, geopolitics, economics, public policy, and more. Please share CEO perspectives with all of your colleagues. I know they'll want to listen too. 
I'm Steve Odlin, and this podcast has been brought to you by the Conference Board. You've been listening to a podcast from the Conference Board, the indispensable ally that has helped businesses through war, recession, and economic transformation since our founding in 1916. As recent unexpected economic challenges persist, you can find the latest and most trusted insights for what's ahead on our website. Please join us on November 29th for a live global virtual briefing from our award-winning economists and other financial experts. Get the latest thinking in how to best weather the economic turbulence by registering for this free briefing at conference-board.org slash topics slash recession.